Welcome to the third episode of our Medical and Dental Council Licensial Exam Preparation. If you are new, kindly subscribe to it. And if you've already subscribed, do turn on the post notification bell so you don't miss any video that is posted on this channel. All right, so now let's continue. So we have a 74-year-old man who has been a smoker since he was 20 and recently been diagnosed with SCLC. What serum erythrocyte picture will confirm the presence of SIADH, that is syndrome of inappropriate uh, ADH, that's antidiuretic hormone. And this person has developed what we call a small cell lung cancer. So normally what happens in the syndrome of inappropriate ADH is that there is high uh, production of this ADH. And as you know, the mechanism of ADH is to reabsorb what water into the blood to reabsorb it. And when there's reabsorption of water, what it means is that the, the osmolarity in the blood will be what? Will be reduced. Osmolarity in the blood will be reduced. Why? Because there is an excretion of what? Sodium in the urine. So urine will become what? Hyperosmolar. Or there will be high urine osmolarity. Low sodium or low sodium in the blood or in the serum as a result, there will be low serum osmolarity. So over here, what will be the appropriate electrolyte picture? There will be what? Low serum sodium, low serum osmolarity, and high osmolarity. And high, high urine osmolarity. So here, your answer should be B. Answer should be B. All right. Now we have a man who was brought into the ED after being stabbed in the chest, okay? Chest is bilaterally clear with muffled heart sound. Chest is clear. So when chest is clear, usually you exclude pneumothorax. But look at this. There's muffled heart. The BP is 60 slash nil. Pulse is kind of normal. Look at it. Jugular vein pressure is raised. What is the most likely diagnosis? Now, uh, there's a tryout called the Bex triad, which is usually uh, comprises of hypotension or low BP, uh, increased jugular vein pressure, and muffled heart sound. And this is actually an indication for cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. And cardiac tamponade simply refers to what? A clinical syndrome that is caused by accumulation of fluid in the pericardial space resulting in reduced ventricular filling and subsequent hemodynamic compromise. So that is what is actually happening in this uh, client. What is happening in this client? And of course, so this is an emergency situation and if we don't take care of it very quick, this person can develop complications such as uh, pulmonary edema, shock, and even death. So what do you do? You give your IV fluid, you, you do your pericardiosynthesis, and you do your open what? Thoracotomy. So basically, this is just what it is. So over here, our likely diagnosis is cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. So your answer should be B. A 50-year-old patient is admitted for elective heniography. Heniography which of the following options will lead to a postponement of the operation? So what it means is that if you're going to do elective surgery, under what condition will you have to postpone it? Under what condition? So usually, if you have an MI, that's myocardial infarction, you don't do surgery or you don't do elective surgery six months after your, 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 your medic or after your post-MI. You don't do it before six months. You don't do it before six months. You must do it after six months because it is believed that when you do it before six months, uh, there's an increase in what? Mortality. There's an increase in mortality. Actually, that's what statistics are shown. So we don't do uh, elective surgery before six months. Before six months. So basically, your answer here should be B. Am I... Uh, two months ago. No. All right.
So we have a 32 year old woman of 39 weeks gestation at 10 student dental day unit, feeling very unwell with sudden onset of epigastric pain associated with nausea and vomiting. Now her temperature is 36, but and look at it, they have what right upper quadrant tenderness, her blood results in mild anemia, low platelet, elevated liver enzymes, and hemolysis. What are you thinking about? This is simply help syndrome. Help syndrome. And what does it characterize of it is characterized by hemo, hemolysis, elevated liver enzyme, and low platelet count. Actually, this is the initials for help. So hemolysis, H, elevated liver enzyme, EL, low platelet count, LP. So you see, as simple as, it, uh, as, simple as that. So usually the main treatment is to deliver the baby as soon as possible. Deliver the baby as soon as possible. So over here, your answer here should be help syndrome, help syndrome. A woman comes with an ulcerated lesion three centimeters in the labia majora, all right? What is the lymphatic drainage of this area? So actually we have a problem with the labia majora and usually the lymphatic drainage over here is the inguinal lymph node, nodes, the inguinal lymph nodes. And of course, the same way for the penis, the scrotum, the perineum, the buttocks, the abdominal wall, all of these areas, all of them, their lymphatic drainage is the inguinal lymph node, the inguinal lymph node. Of course, the inguinal lymph node is grouped into superficial and deep, superficial and deep. And over here, our likely diagnosis should be B. And here is a diagram to show you what the labia majora or where it is. So you see, they all drain into this lymphatic node. All right. So here is it. There's a labia, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but that is it. So they all drain into the lymphatic nodes around. That is the inguinal lymph nodes. So here your answer should be superficial inguinal lymph node. A man posts uh, cholecystectomy presented with jaundice, fever, and dark urine. Dark urine. What is the most, most diagnostic investigation? Please be careful because almost all of these you can use it or it is an, uh, it's an investigation for something like this, but the most diagnostic one you are thinking of ERCP. ERCP. That is endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Now, in the normal setting, you wouldn't actually do that. You will actually go for CT. You actually go for CT. But of course, for the sake of exams, and you're asking for the most, most diagnostic, that is why we can easily go in for what? ERCP. And the diagnosis here is cholelithiasis with cholangitis. That is the diagnosis over here. And of course, you can easily use your CT to get whatever that you're looking for. But since you're talking for the most diagnostic, which is actually not practical to use the ERCP, but then for sake of exams, please take ERCT. But practically, you definitely use a CT scan. CT scan. So here your answer should be A. All right. A 75, 79-year-old stumbled and sustained a minor head injury. Okay, this man is old and there's a minor head injury two weeks ago. He has become increasingly confused, drowsy, and unsteady. He has a GCS of 13. He takes in warfarin for AFib, that's atrial fibrillation. What is the most likely diagnosis? Look, this man is old and with a minor injury, the person having these symptoms. And usually, people like this, they normally develop what we call subdural hematoma or subdural hemorrhage, subdural hemorrhage. So for them, even without any obvious trauma, they can still develop uh, this uh, hemorrhage, all right? Because they are old and they are 
so of your brain begins to shrink. We call it brain atrophy, all right? Thereby making the bridging veins very vulnerable to any slight change in the head, okay? They make it very vulnerable. So the little increase in trachea pressure or metastasis, there is a problem in the head. And that is called what? subdural hematoma. Subdural hematoma. And of course, the symptoms are already there. And also look out for what we call the crescent shape collection of what? blood. So if you do a uh, head CT, so then you will see this crin or circled shape uh, diagram. Let me put it that way. And that there's a lot of what blood inside it. Okay, so this is very, very specific, and that helps us to differentiate this from other uh, hemorrhages. So basically, your answer here should be uh, D. And how do you manage this patient? You do what evacuation by blur who craniostomy. And second line is what craniostomy if the clot is organized, if the clot is organized. So over here, you are thinking of subdura hemorrhage or subdura hematoma. Why? It's old, okay, and there's what a minor injury. Usually it shouldn't cause it, but because they are old, easily the breaching uh, veins are very hot, vulnerable. So here, that is your answer. A 25 year old female complains of intermittent pain in her fingers. Intermittent, that means it's not continuous. She describes episode of numbness and burning of the fingers. She wears gloves whenever she leaves the house. That should tell you that either she's in the winter or the weather is very, very cold. So what is the most probable diagnosis? So this you are thinking of Reynolds phenomenon. Reynolds phenomenon, all right? So like I said earlier on, intermittent means it is not continuous. And usually... When they are having this kind of uh, pain in their uh, fingers, in their hands, what have you, is usually because there is decreased uh, blood flow in those arteries. There is decreased blood flow, and that can only occur in Renault syndrome. In Renault syndrome, so that is why over here your answer should be Renault phenomenon. Renault, actually, it's the same thing, kind of. All right. So basically. That and usually it is triggered by cold or emotional stress. Cold or emotional stress. Now in Kawasaki, there is a vasculitis or there is inflammation of medium-sized vessels. Medium-sized vessels. And this normally leads to long-lasting of fever. And then in the Takayusu, Takayasu, there is a vasculitis of large size vessels, mainly the iota and its major branches. And in Berman's disease, there is thrombosis in the small and medium sized blood vessels, typically in the legs, and leads to gangrene formation. Gangrene formation. That's over here. Our likely diagnosis should be E, E, Reynolds phenomenon or Reynolds syndrome. A 22 year old lady has been unwell for some time. She came to the hospital with complaints of fever and painful vesicles in her left ear. Left ear, what is the most probable diagnosis? I don't know if this has herpes zoster uh, articles, herpes zoster articles, because it has to do with, in the, it has to do with the ear. All right, so this is hepizosta articles. And when uh, it is associated with the facial nerve, we call it Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. When it is associated with facial paralysis or the facial nerve. All right, so it's an infection of the inner, the middle, and in the external ear. And it manifests as severe nostalgia, that is severe ear pain, with cutaneous vesicular eruption, usually of the external canal and the pinna. And I'll show you a diagram of what I mean. So you now you see, look at this. These are the eruptions or the vesicular eruptions, vesicular eruptions. These are the vesicular eruptions. You see around the external ear, the pinna. Look at it. 
All right. So that is all over here. Your answer should be what? Uh, should be B. Hepizosta articles. Hepizosta articles. A five-year-old girl had earache and some yellowish foul-smelling discharge. Perforation of the attic and conductive hearing loss. Look at this. This is your clue. The attic. All right, and conductive hearing loss. She has no past history of ear infection. What is the most likely or appropriate diagnosis? So this, we are thinking of acquired cholesteatoma. And what is it? It result, it's as a result of a chronic infection or ear infection that are usually associated with perforation of the tympanic membrane at the attic, at the attic, that is a mass that is seen in the attic with perforation at pars flaccida. This is in contrast to the medial tympanic membrane, which is in congenital. So when you see this mass forming at the medial side of the tympanic membrane, then you are thinking of a congenital cholesteatoma, all right? And of course, congenital cholestitumas too also has no past history. And that is something that is confusing us in this uh, question. However, since there's a perfusion of the attic and the conductive hearing loss, we can easily conclude that this is acquired. This is acquired, not congenital, not congenital. So in congenital, like I said, the media side, there's normal tympanic membrane and no previous history of ear discharge or perforation or what surgery or surgery so over here your answer should be c so since you are also watching give me the differentials or let me know how you can differentiate between attack, uh, acute otitis media otitis media with effusion and otitis externa how will you differentiate between these three so please let me know in the comment Section. Don't forget we are learning, so let me know in the comment section unless someone also gets to learn something. All right, so over here, your answer should be acquired. Acquired. Please, you can get all these questions on the Medent app. So if you're moving too fast, just pause the video and then watch it. But again, you can get the questions on the Medent app available on Play Store. I'll put a link in the description box. So kindly do check it out and enjoy the amazing features it has. All right. A female with type 1 diabetes mellitus would like to know about a deficiency of vitamins in pregnancy that can be harmful. A deficiency of which vitamin can lead to teratogenic effects in the child. So this one is just easy because usually when Pregnant people can we normally prescribe them with what folic acid. Why? Because folic acid is involved in what neural tube formation or development. So in the absence of folic acid, what it means that there will be neural tube defect. And neural tube defect means defect in the brain, the spine, or the spinal cord, which trust me, you wouldn't like your children or your child to go through such teratogenic effect. So the answer is A, folic acid. A 23 year old woman has been having pain in the base of her thumb. The pain is reproduced when lifting her three month old baby or changing diapers and also with forceful abduction of the thumb against resistance. What is the likely diagnosis? So this, you are thinking of tenosynovitis. Tenosynovitis because tenosynovitis normally occurs in people who are breastfeeding or people who are in the daycare, taking care of children, who are involved in lifting children up and down and stuff like that. So that is what decreasing tenosynovitis. Very common in these people. Very, very common. So here your answer should be C. C. Okay, so look at this. This is what is happening to this mother. All right, so when they lift the child, continuously lifting the child can lead to 
that ten uh, damage or problem over there that is causing the pain. So here is C. C. A six man old child present with fever and cough. His mother has rushed him to the ED asking for help. Temperature is 39 degrees and her child is feeding poorly. Now, of course, this is a lower respiratory tract infection. And the most common one in children of this age is bronchiolitis. Bronchiolitis, normally caused by respiratory syncytial virus. So that is the most common uh, lower respiratory tract infection in children. So you are thinking of this as A. A. How do you manage it? You give oxygen and nas uh, nasogastric what? feeding because this patient is feeding poorly. So you pass the, the food through the nose, through the nose into the stomach. All right. Answer is A. A 75-year-old man collapsed while walking in his garden. He recovered fully within 30 minutes with BP of 11080 and a regular pulse of 70 beats per minute. He has a systolic mama on examination. Guys, anytime you hear of a systolic mama, then you are thinking of a problem with the what? The iota. All right, so there can be uh, aortic stenosis or hep uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy present. But look at it, this person is old. This person is old, so you're definitely thinking of what? Aortic stenosis, thinking of aortic stenosis. So what investigation, that's the question, what investigation will you do? Will you do? So you are thinking of a valve defect, right? So if it's a valve defect, then you are going in for your echo. You are going in for your echo. So echo allows you to monitor how the heart and its valves are functioning. So go in for echo. But in children, like I said, diagnosis could be what? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A 35 year old man with a history of schizophrenia is brought to the ER by his friends due to drowsiness. On examination, he is generally rigid. A diagnosis of a neuroleptic malignant syndrome, except actually over here, what the accent, which of the following is not a future of a, a neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So what then is a neuroleptic malignant syndrome? This is simply a, a reaction to neuroleptic medication. So usually it's characterized by fever, muscular rigidity, altered mental status, and autonomic dysfunction. Autonomic dysfunction. And now this usually occurs soon after the start or in an increasing dose of antipsychotic drug. So over here, they are saying usually occurs after prolonged. No, it occurs immediately. So this should be the odd one out of it. It should be the odd one out. So here, your answer here should be what? D. That is the odd one out because it occurs soon after the start or in increasing dose of the medication. A 33 year old drug addict wants to quit. She says she, says she is ready to stop the drug. She is being supported by her friends and family. That's wonderful. So what drug treatment will you give her? So over here, you're looking for a drug that will help her to manage the withdrawal with syndromes, uh, the withdrawal symptoms. Because people like this who are addicted, when they want to stop immediately, trust me, they'll go through withdrawal uh, symptoms and they need to manage it. And you can only manage it with methadone. Methadone or methadone. Yeah, so that's a drug of choice. That is a drug of choice. All right. So usually, naloxone is also used for what? Opioid overdose or abuse. Disulfiram is used for treatment for alcoholic or chronic alcoholism. Chronic alcoholism and tobacco abuse, you normally use what? Bupropion. Bupropion. Pion. <laughs> All right. So basically, that is it. So don't get confused with the different, different kinds of treatment to use.
when uh, there's an abuse or yeah so d is your answer methadone a 16 month child presents with drawling sore throat and loss of voice he has fever of 38.2 what is your next step towards management so there are actually uh, four d's that you need to know so actually it's a case of uh, acute epiglottitis and it is involved why is so because it involves four d's at least you should see two or three being present or three being present so we have what dysphagia that is difficulty swallowing dysphonia abnormal voice we have drawling and we have what distress of course this patient is in distress all right it's also drawling over here they've told you there's dysphonia because there's loss of voice definitely there'll be what dysphagia also being what present and of course in this given case we are thinking of doing what intubation we are thinking of doing intubation to prevent blockage of respiration to prevent blockage of respiration because acute epiglottitis involve all of these things so what do you do you call your anesthesiologist call your anesthesiologist so you can do this operation successfully so here your answer should be c all right We have a 62 year old woman complaining of unsteadiness when walking. On examination, there's a pyramidal weakness of, his, of her left lower limb and reduced pain and temperature on the right. So you see this epsilateral and this is contralateral, right? Good. So joint position sense is impaired at her left grade two but it's normal elsewhere. She has a definite left extensor plantar response and the right plantar response is equivocal. What is the lesion? So you see, with, with any time there is a reduced pain in temperature on the right side, it means the lesion is occurring on the left or on the opposite side. So you're thinking of this as left mid thoracic cord. And the diagnosis is brown squared syndrome. Brown sequat syndrome yes and this is caused by a damage on one half of the spinal cord which results in paralysis and loss of proprioception on the same side that is epsilatra and there's loss of pain and temperature on the opposite that is what contra lateral contra lateral so basically that's over here you go in for d as your likely uh Location for the lesion. Location for the lesion. A 26 year old presents to the ED with increasing shortness of breath on the left side and chest pain. He has, he has been a heavy smoker for the past four years. He doesn't have any past medical history. Again, when you have shortness of breath and increased chest pain, of course, with the history of smoking, you are thinking of a pneumothorax, actually spontaneous pneumothorax. That is what comes to mind, spontaneous pneumothorax. So basically, that should be your answer. So here your answer should be what? E. 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 A patient with hepatocellular cancer has raised level of ferritin. What is the most probable cause? Now, before I continue, you must know that you can find all of these questions on the Medent app. I will put a link in the description, so do well to download it, okay? And if you're new, please subscribe to it. And if you are, you are enjoying what we are doing, please let us know in the comment section and let us know your questions as well. It really helps for us to know that people are really following us and people are really enjoying what we are doing. Okay. All right. So we have hepatocellular cancer and there's what raised ferritin. Now, ferritin is simply what? The storage form of iron. Storage form of iron. And when there is a disorder in it or when there is an increased uh, ferritin in the body, what it means that 
there is what we call hemochromatosis. Hemochromatosis. That is a name for a disorder where there is too much ion buildup in the body. And of course, it is a cause of a hepatocellular carcinoma, which is with what this and all that. So basically, that is what it is. So here you are thinking of hemochromatosis. No, no, it's not B. It is A. The answer should be A. 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 All right. So basically, this is it. And this brings us to the end of this episode. So please do like, share, and let people know about what is happening over here. And see you in the next episode.